Welcome to the Full Moon Film Buff, episode 47. We're going to talk about Night of the Howling Beast, a.k.a. The Werewolf and the Yeti from 1975. I watched this on Tubi. I had not seen this before. As always, we're going to begin with the prominent crew and cast. The film was directed by Miguel Iglesias, written by Paul Nashi, billed as Jacinto Molina, with effects makeup by Manolita G. Fraile. The cast includes Paul Nashi playing Valdemar Daninsky, Joseph Castillo Escalona as Professor Lacombe, billed as Castillo Escalona, Mercedes Molina playing Sylvia Lacombe, billed as Grace Mills, Gaspar Indio Gonzalez playing Tigra, billed as Indio Gonzalez, Gil Vidal playing Larry Talbot, Luis Indini as Sekar Khan, and Sylvia Solar playing Wandessa. Now, this was Mercedes Molina's first film role. Luis Indua has over 200 IMDb credits, stretching over 35 years. This is his second appearance in an El Hombre Lobo movie. Unfortunately, this is a slight dip in the quality from Paul Nashi's films for me. The plot doesn't hold up as well as previous entrees. It does feel like they were trying to up the shock content and were less concerned with the story. That said, it does still clear the threshold, and I did enjoy it, so I do recommend it. A really interesting tidbit is that this is the first El Hombre Lobo film with a happy ending, and by all accounts, it's the only one. Although a Yeti is involved in the plot, it is two werewolf women, and not the Yeti, who transform Valdemar into a werewolf in this film, thus giving him yet another origin story for his lycanthropy. We do get a great fight between a werewolf and a Yeti, and that's great. The film involved more nudity and graphic gore than most of Nashi's previous Wolfman films, and as a result, was never theatrically shown in the UK. Also, one of the members of the scholarly expedition to Tibet is named Larry Talbot in an homage. I don't think that they ever used his last name in the movie. I only learned this tidbit from the IMDb page. Let's cover the synopsis. This film starts fast. A Yeti attacks three men in a snowy mountainside forest. We get lots of good looks at the werewolf makeup during the credits. Cut to London with bagpipes playing Scotland the Brave. Valdemar Naninsky meets with Professor Lacombe after flirting with the professor's daughter, Sylvia. The professor tells Valdemar about how Dr. Silas Newman was killed while searching for the abominable snowman in Tibet. I'll bet that's what we saw before the credits. The professor has Dr. Newman's bag, which contains a Yeti scalp, his journal, and photographs of the Yeti. The pair plan to finish Dr. Newman's work. However, bad weather has closed the mountain passes. A local knows a man who knows a secret path always open no matter the weather. He hangs out at an opium den. By the way, the Tibetan music being played in the background sounds distractingly like the opening acoustic part of Stairway to Heaven. It drove me kind of batty watching the movie. The path is called the Path of the Demon of the Red Moon. So Valdemar heads off alone with the creepy locals. The rest of the expedition decide to stay at the base camp. The locals talk about the demons that come out under the red moon. Valdemar's guide disappears, and Valdemar gets completely lost. The rest of the expedition have to try and find Valdemar. The Tibetans do a protection ritual because they are very afraid of the demons. A starving and exhausted Valdemar is captured by two cannibalistic werewolf women in an ice cave. They are also priestesses to Moloch, I think. That part was a little unclear. The pair take Valdemar prisoner and make him their sex slave. There is now an iron porticolis on the cave's entrance, so Valdemar cannot escape. He stabs one of the women through the heart with a silver arrow. She dies. The other bites Valdemar before he stabs her too. I guess he found a key because he does get out of the cave. Under a full moon, Valdemar succumbs to the lycanthropy for the first time and kills three random roving bandits. Sylvia, who did come on this expedition with her father and Valdemar, wanders away from the camp at night. A drunk jerk that's been a jerk the whole trip, but I never caught his name, tries to rape Sylvia. She gets away, but the jerk doesn't get away from the werewolf. Tibetan bandits, led by a guy named Sekar Khan, kill Tigra, the Tibetan foreman of the expedition. The other workers end up joining up with the bandits because they're afraid of them. Valdemar's English friends are ambushed, and a few are killed, but most are captured. Werewolf Valdemar continues to pick off bandits one by one while shrugging off bullets, but he won't hurt Sylvia. Next morning, Valdemar is back to his human form. 
he and Sylvia find each other, she catches him up on the horrible fate of the expedition so far. The bandits impale Larry, one of the prisoners. Larry begs Valdemar for death. In the bandits' palace, uh, okay, it's, it's a palace, the Khan is getting treated for some kind of ailment, nasty-looking sores all over his back. The Khan wants the English doctor to treat him if Wandessa, a witch doctor, can't cure him. Valdemar and Sylvia find a kindly hermit who has a mute servant. The hermit not only knows that Wandessa is making things worse for the population, but he also knows of a cure for Valdemar's lycanthropy, a plant with red flowers mixed with the blood of a young woman. The hermit chains Valdemar to two trees in an attempt to confine the werewolf. Sylvia sees this. It doesn't work. Valdemar just busts the chains. The werewolf continues killing bandits. The hermit gives Sylvia all the deets on Valdemar's curse. The cons men find and kill the hermit and the mute servant. Valdemar and Sylvia are captured as well. Valdemar is chained up next to the professor, who is under the impression that his daughter got away. Wandessa orders the death of the professor. She, she knows all about Valdemar's curse. She says she knows how to control him. Wandessa hauls off several female prisoners, including Melody, to be tortured in an attempt to convince Valdemar to serve her. Melody gets her back skin. Ugh. A random captured princess helps other young women escape, including Sylvia. Sylvia helps Valdemar escape. He fights the Khan's lieutenant, stabbing him with the sword. The random princess and her harem posse kill Wandessa. Valdemar fights Stecker Khan in human form. Eventually, the Khan is knocked into a pit of spikes where he dies. Unfortunately, the professor's dead body is discovered in that very same pit. Valdemar and Sylvia get out of the palace. They separate because Valdemar can feel the full moon rising. He turns into a werewolf. An actual yeti carries Sylvia off. Werewolf Valdemar fights the Yeti and rips its throat out, but in the process he is gravely wounded. Sylvia manages to cure him of his lycanthropy by placing a small Tibetan flower mixed with her blood in his mouth. In the end, Valdemar changes back into a man and goes off into the sunset with Sylvia, the only two survivors. Honestly, I can't even remember a single transformation scene in this movie. I'm pretty certain the filmmakers just skipped all that in the interest of moving the story along. The decision is one I wholeheartedly support. The makeup looks fine. It's not bad. It's just not anything new. And this is a state common in werewolf films at this time. They're not, they, they don't have the technology yet to improve on the transformation of the makeup, so they're minimizing it to just get, a, get on with things. Now, the big new addition to the El Hombre Lobo lore is the inclusion of The Cure. The Cure does harken back to the earliest films we've watched. I was reminded of the plant from Werewolf of London that could suppress the transformation. Perhaps given time, Dr. Glendon could have turned the plant into a cure, like in this film. I also noticed that this is the first El Hombre Lobo film to drop the woman who loves him angle. I mean, yes, it is clear that Sylvia has the hots for Valdemar, but it's not mentioned by the hermit as a requirement of the cure. So the happy ending had me intrigued. So I did a quick review of all the pre-1975 werewolf movies I've watched, and this is the first film since House of Dracula from 1945 to have an unambiguously happy ending for Larry Talbot. And then it took four movies to get there. Typically werewolves get a tragic ending where they are released from their condition by death. The cure is dying. Sometimes a werewolf is allowed the nobility of self-sacrifice like in The Return of the Vampire from 1944. Most times they're simply stopped and killed. So this opens up a whole new avenue for the werewolf movie. We've got all the pieces in place now for the werewolf to not only be a villainous or tragic antagonist, or maybe a tragic protagonist, but also a hero. And we'll see that soon. Next, I want to mention the big lesson that you should learn from this movie. Don't go alone. Valdemar's big mistake in this movie is separating himself from his fellow explorers. The expedition to finish Newman's work arrives in Tibet to find poor weather. Funnily enough, we don't actually see that much bad weather or even snow on the ground in the movie, but the movie says the weather's bad and the passes are closed. Fine. We'll accept that as fact. The majority of the team is perfectly fine waiting the storm out. And honestly, I agree with them, but not Valdemar. He's determined to rush out and... See, this is where Valdemar loses me. What's he in a rush for? They know Newman's dead. No lives hang in the balance. No one needs rescuing. Why risk disaster? Learn from the tortoise. Slow and steady wins the race. 
The film presents this headlong rush of Valdemar's as evidence of bravery and courage. Sylvia certainly seems impressed with his risk-taking behavior. However, let's look at the consequences to Valdemar that stem from this impulsive decision. First, he risked being taken advantage of. I kind of expected his creepy local guides to rob him and attempt to kill him. He was outnumbered three to one. Of course, that's not exactly what happened. Instead, that small group is ambushed by bandits. The locals are killed, and Valdemar narrowly escapes. He finds himself alone, lost, undersupplied, and suffering from exposure to the cold, snow, and altitude. He has no way to navigate. He stumbles about in the wild. He should have died. That's the typical outcome in this scenario. You can say that he was lucky to have found the cannibalistic werewolf women in the cave. They did save his life by giving him food, shelter, and the elements and warmth. They also infected him with lycanthropy and intended to keep him against his will to serve them. So better than dead, but not a good situation. On top of all the personal suffering Valdemar brought on himself, he also can reasonably be accused of bringing doom on the expedition. Once they set out to find and rescue him, they unknowingly set themselves on a collision course with Sekar Khan and his bandits. With one exception, they will be killed. If they're lucky, most will be tortured and then killed. All this because Valdemar had to rush off ahead and alone, and it all could have been avoided. Now, to be fair to Valdemar, on the other hand, it did end up working out, at least for Valdemar and Sylvia. First, we don't know for certain that Sekar Khan and the bandits wouldn't have found the expedition anyway. If they had been captured, Valdemar would have been killed or captured as well, and would not have had the werewolf powers that enabled him to rescue Sylvia and for the pair to escape the tower. Plus, werewolf Valdemar did save Sylvia from being raped by one of the Westerners. On that front, however, I don't know that Valdemar needed to be a werewolf to stop the rapist, so maybe everything worked out in the best to the end. I don't really think so, but it, it was an entertaining movie. On another topic, it's been a while since we've talked about Orientalism, but I have to at least briefly address the issue here. This is an extreme example of Orientalism. The Tibetan culture portrayed in this movie is, I don't even know the right words to describe it. It's made strange and exotic. How weird and different are these people? There are bandit warriors and sexy witch doctors. It's all background for our hero. Its exoticness contaminates him, transforms him, and nearly kills him. In this version of Tibet, life is cheap, the people barbaric, and the idea of something supernatural, like a werewolf or abominable snowman, seems more plausible. It's certainly not the everyday life of the average moviegoer in Spain or America, but it is everyday life for someone, Tibetans, and their everyday life is not casually supernatural. This has been the second reference to the Yeti in the El Hombre Lobo movie so far, and it's been a while since Tibet was first introduced to a werewolf movie. So let's do a little refresher course. That very first werewolf movie with sound, Werewolf of London from 1935, introduced the country of Tibet into werewolf lore. Dr. Wilfred Glendon traveled to Tibet to research a rare flower that only blooms under the full moon. He's attacked and bitten by a werewolf. It's never called a Yeti in Werewolf of London and becomes a werewolf himself under the light of the full moon. I feel like the inclusion of Tibet into the occasional El Hombre Lobo film is an homage to this early pioneering werewolf movie. At first, I have to admit, it seemed cartoony to reference the Yeti or Abominable Snowman. Night of the Howling Beast caused me to reconsider this position. After all, the Yeti, in all its manifestations, including the North American Sasquatch, furry, humanoid, often tall, sometimes violent. Now, if you squint, it's easy to blur a yeti into a werewolf, with the addition that the fact that werewolves are most often depicted as reverting to their human form upon death, helping to explain why this particular cryptid's corpse might prove difficult to find. This could be why it's so hard to find Bigfoot. Of course, all that glosses over and ignores all the other Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and Yeti lore, both cultural and artistic. So this way of viewing werewolves and yetis is an incomplete and certainly favors the werewolf side. It's still cool. So if you like lycanthropes, like, share, and subscribe. Contribute your thoughts and additional observations in the comments below. Let me know what I missed or what you noticed. Next, I plan on discussing Santo versus the She-Wolves from 1976. Keep your eye on the moon, silver bullet in the chamber, and we'll see you back next episode.